In the year 156 AD, an 86-year-old man was brought before Roman officials and commanded to announce his atheism. Now, he was not an atheist by our standards, but he was an atheist according to Roman standards because he refused to worship the emperor as God. Polycarp knew that a denial a failure to renounce his atheism would result in his death and that it would either be burned alive or being thrown to wild animals. And three times he was given the opportunity by Roman officials, they said, swear and curse Christ and we will release you. Swear and curse Christ and you go free. And they gave him three chances and this was his response. He said, 86 years I have served him and he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king who saved me? Eighty-six years I've served him. He's never done me wrong. How then can I blaspheme the king who saved me? Polycarp had a courageous faith, even in the face of danger and pain and certainly fear. And Polycarp was not spared his life. Just a short time after that, a fire was lit and he was burned alive for his faith in Jesus Christ. And his words still echo down through the days of history to us today. We're talking this week about what it means to have a courageous faith in Christ. And I want you to know that, that you need a courageous faith. I need a courageous faith to, to live out our calling as followers of Jesus Christ in this world, we need to have a courageous faith. It's essential. But, but not only do we need to have a courageous faith, not, not only is it essential, it's the means by which our lives can fulfill their purpose. Right? Every one of you have purpose. We are all created on purpose. We were saved on purpose. And God has a purpose for your life. And that is to ultimately to use your gifts and your talents and your abilities and your very life to bring God glory. And it's a courageous faith that positions us to live for God's glory. We're in the book of Philippians, and our goal is to develop an undeterred trust in God despite the danger, fear, and pain that we face. Despite that, listen, we all are going to experience those things, but in spite of those things, we want to have an undeterred faith. And Paul, as he wrote to the church in Philippi, he wanted them to have a courageous faith, right? He, 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 knew, he knew the danger that they were facing. It wasn't safe to live out their faith. It wasn't easy to live out their faith. And neither is it for you or will it be for you. But he wanted them to be confident, grounded in who Jesus was, in the love that he had for them, in the goodness and the grace of the gospel that they had been forgiven and saved and redeemed, adopted, unconditionally loved by God. And he wanted them to live lives for what really mattered. Be because of what had happened. You know, I appreciate what, what Rian shared last night at, at Sing Time. And just reflecting on, on the weight and the, and, of the cross and what Jesus did for us and what that really means then for our lives. And, and so for Paul, as we looked at yesterday, he said, for me it means to live as Christ and to die as gain. That that's what it means for me. That means that my whole life, the focus, the ambition, the purpose, the aim of my life is to live for the one who loved me and who gave himself for me to live for Jesus. And whether I live or whether I die, my life belongs to Him. And, and I think, no doubt, it was, it was that same sort of mindset that enabled the man Polycarp to face death with such confidence, to face a painful death at the age of 86 with such confidence because he says to live as Christ and to die is gained. A gospel-centered perspective. That's what we talked about yesterday, seeing life through the lenses of the gospel. Today, as we continue our journey, I want us to see that courageous faith requires not only gospel-centered perspective, but gospel-centered action. Th that our faith has to be something that isn't just something that's intellectual or something that, that we believe in our minds, but it is something that we live out in our actions. Right? Because faith is not merely intellectual agreement with God. Faith is not merely faith is not just agreeing with the facts. It's not just believing that, that, that God exists. It's not just believing the Bible's true. It's not just believing that Jesus lived or that He died or even that He rose again. It's, it's much more than that. Faith, courageous faith, faith in God is, has to always 
take action. In fact, God is not interested in nor looking for you to just agree with Him. Right? We, we all love agreement. How many of you have ever tried to get someone to agree with you? Anybody? All right. Yes, we've all done that, right? And, and we have a perspective, right? We have a, a way of seeing things or believing things, and we want to get people to agree with us. We, we try to bring them to our perspective, right? I, I'm, a, I'm a pretty passionate Philadelphia Eagles fan, right? And I'm... Yeah, yeah, yes, all right. Soon to be... Soon to be two-time Super Bowl champs, all right? But... I always try to convince people to, to come join. You know, I'm like, hey, you know, if you want to root for a great team, you're, there's room, you know. The Wentz wagon's not full, you know. So we, we, all, are, we all are familiar with, we, we want to get people to agree with and to see things the way we do. But, but God's, not, God's not asking you just to agree with Him. But He's looking you to believe Him. And belief always takes action. So if you have your Bible, turn to Philippians chapter 1. We're going to begin in verse 22 and uh, work our way through the end of the chapter this morning. So Philippians chapter 1, and uh, we'll begin in verses 22 through 24. Paul says, Now if I live on in the flesh, this means fruitful work for me. And I don't know which one I should choose, for I am pressured by both. I have the desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Now, remember, Paul just said to live as Christ and to die as gain. And then he says, if I live on in the flesh, if I keep on living here, it, it means fruitful work. I'm going to have the opportunity to serve Christ and to use my life for His glory and His kingdom and His purpose. That was his focus. And he says, but, but I don't really know. I'm torn between the two. He says, I'm pressured by those. I have the desire, I have a desire, a passion to depart and be with Christ, which is better but to remain in the flesh is necessary for you. What was Paul saying was, you know, he's not suicidal here, okay? He's, he's not, he doesn't want to die, but what he was expressing was that he had come to love Jesus so deeply and so passionately, and he was so close to him and he's walking with him that he said, I, I just can't wait to be with him. I can't wait for the moment to be before him, to see his face, to fall on my knees and to worship him in holiness and beauty and splendor. He says, I long for that. But he says, what's better, even though it's not easier, I want to remain here for you. Paul realized that, that his life had a purpose and he wanted to fulfill that purpose. And so continue with me, verse 25. He says, since I'm persuaded, I'm convinced of this, I know I will remain and continue with all of you for your advancement and the joy of in the faith, so that because of me, your confidence may grow in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. So Paul says, I, I'm ready to be with Jesus. I'm, if it's today, that's going to be a great day, but I'm willing, I'm persuaded, I'm convinced that even though life is hard, he's in prison, he's suffering for his faith, but he says, even though I'm suffering and even though life is painful and not easy, I know that remaining and continuing is going to matter because I want you to advance in your faith and I want you to have joy in the Lord and in your faith. And he says, I want you to have confidence, right? We began on Monday by talking about the fact that we need confidence. Paul wanted these believers to be confident, not in themselves, not in their abilities, not in their talents, not in their toughness, not you can handle it, you can do it. But he wanted them to be confident in who Jesus was, in his love for them and his grace towards them and the power that he would give them to live for him. He wanted them to be confident. And so Paul, he was convinced that his life had a purpose. And I want you to know this morning that every single one of you have purpose. Right? Every single one of you has been made in the image of God. You were fashioned in the very likeness of your Creator. And not only did God make you, not only are you His by creation, but if you're a follower of Jesus, you have been redeemed, you have been bought with the blood of Jesus Christ, you've been saved, You've been redeemed. God bought you. He purchased you. You belong to Him. You are the object of His love and affection. He looks at you with the eyes of compassion and love. He looks at you because now as being clothed in the very righteousness of His Son, Jesus Christ. Right? When God looks at me and when God looks at you, He doesn't just see all the mess that I am. He doesn't just see all the mess that you are. He sees the very righteousness of Christ and He saved you and created you to live on purpose. One of my favorite verses, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, says that we're God's masterpiece. 
His very best work. And He created us in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You have purpose. And, and, and it's important to understand that if we're going to live out a courageous faith and if we're going to have gospel-centered obedience, if we're going to obey Jesus and follow Him and take action in our faith, we need to know that, that we have purpose and that the Christian life is not passive. It's a life of action. Paul's going to dive into the heart of the matter. Look at verse 27. And this is what he wants the, his brothers and sisters in Philippi to know to get. He says, just one thing. Live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What, live worthy of the gospel of Christ. He says, just one thing. Says, you know, if you just remember one thing, if you just get one thing, here's what I want you to get. Live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. I think that was the throbbing desire of Paul's heart. To live a life that was worthy of his calling, of the gospel. Now, it's important to understand, Paul was not saying try to be worthy of the gospel. Right? Paul's not saying you've got, to, you've got to somehow make yourself worthy of this calling. No, you have been made worthy by Jesus. Does that make sense? Are you with me? You don't have to try to become worthy. Right? God's made you worthy. He has adopted you. He has placed His love on you. You're His child. You belong to Him. But what he's saying is that we're to live a life in a manner worthy of what has happened to us, that we're to understand who we are in Christ, we're to understand what he's done, and then we're to live a life that is equal to that calling. Notice, this, this, was, a, this was a reoccurring passion for Paul. He put this in several letters. Look in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4, Paul says, I therefore a prisoner for the Lord, written around the same time as Philippians while he's in prison in Rome. He says, I urge you to walk in a manner, what? Worthy of your calling to which you've been called. He says, I, I want you to understand what the gospel means, what you've been called to. I, I want you to understand how glorious the gospel is, how amazing it is, and I want you to live a life worthy of the gospel. He says, I urge you. And that word means to, to, co to, to come alongside and to beg or to entreat, to admonish. And so it's a very passionate word. Paul was a passionate guy. Right? And so he says, I, I urge you, I, I, passion, I, I want you to get this. And he says, walk worthy. And that, that word worthy simply means it's like an equal weight. And he says, I, I want you to understand your calling and live a life that, that understands that calling, that divine invitation to know God and to live for His glory and His purposes. You used to be dead. You used to be separated from God. But now you're alive. Now you're His. You belong to Him. Your life has purpose. And I want you to get that. And Paul was so passionate about that. As he wrote uh, the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, verse 10. Same thing. Paul says, So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 12. We exhorted each of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. And so you can see almost in every letter that Paul wrote, you, you, you see this passion coming through. You notice that what we're passionate about comes out. Have you ever noticed that? That, that what you're excited about, what you love, you naturally talk about what you love. Right? You, no one has to force you to talk about what you love. No one has to force you to talk about what you're passionate about. And for Paul, you can see this passion come out. He wanted people to get it. He, he's just like, I, I, want, I want you to get how amazing the gospel is, how good it is, how glorious it is. I want you to understand what you've been called to. You've been called to His kingdom and to glory. God has invited you to be a participant in His kingdom. One of my favorite verses, Luke chapter 12, verse 32, Jesus said, Fear not, little flock, for it's the Father's good pleasure to give you His kingdom. That's a verse God has used in my life when I have been anxious and worried and afraid and discouraged. And God just reminded me of this. He says, fear not, little flock. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you His kingdom. You may be going through a difficult journey right now. You may be suffering right now. You may be facing danger, fear, or pain. You may feel lonely or lost or feel like God is far, but fear not because God has chosen to give you His kingdom and you're going to share in His glory. The gospel is so much more than a way to go to heaven when you die, right? The gospel isn't just about that. It's an invitation to live for the kingdom of God and for the glory of God. And so as we go back to Philippians, he says just one thing, live your life in a manner worthy 
of the gospel of Christ. That word, your life, it actually is a word that refers to citizenship. And I think Paul had in mind here that, you know, Philippi was a colony of Rome, and as such, it reflected the architecture, the values, the culture of Rome. And so when someone entered the city of Philippi, they, they would be reminded of Rome. They would be reminded of the Roman government and the Roman culture. And I think in the same way, Paul wanted the church, right, the, the body of Christ, and the church is made up of everyone who knows Jesus Christ. He wanted the church to be a colony of heaven on earth. That, that the church and, and all of our local churches and, and Chehi, as we're here together, it ought to be a colony of heaven, right, where the values of heaven, where the values of God's kingdom are displayed and lived out for the world to see. And so he says, live your life. You're a citizen, not just of this earth, but you're a citizen of God's kingdom. And you're to represent him, to live for him. So live in a manner worthy of your citizenship. You're, you're a citizen of, of heaven. And then he goes on in verse 27 to show what it looks like. He says in the second half of verse 27, Whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I will hear about that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, working side by side for the faith of the gospel. Standing firm is a military term. And so Paul was using a military term. He says, don't budge, don't give up, don't back down. He says, stand firm, be confident. The one who called you will not fail you. He will not let you go. So be confident, stand firm, and be unified. Right? You can't stand firm alone. Right? The Christian life is not a solo sport. It's not something that we can live out by ourselves. God has not equipped you nor enabled you to live out your faith by yourself. Now, yes, it's personal. You have to come to Jesus for yourself, right? You have to place your faith in Him to begin a relationship with Him and to know Him. But God's not called you to experience or live out that faith alone. You weren't equipped. That's why we have the church. That's why we be part of a body of believers because we need one another. He says, stand firm, not by yourself, but stand firm in one spirit with one, more, one mind, working side by side for the faith of the gospel. Right? We, we need each other. To walk worthy, you're going to need encouragement. You're going to need support. Right? We need one another. We need some people that will walk with us. Standing firm. Working side by side. That, that side by side is, is an athletic sort of term. So Paul uses a military term, and then he uses an athletic term. Term. And I already sort of mentioned that I'm a pretty passionate Eagles fan. Paul was a sports guy. I, we, he uses sports illustrations all the time. If football had existed, I think Paul would have been a huge football fan. I'm just saying, right? But uh, my family, we're pretty big football fans. Um, that was after some incredible Eagles victory. I'm not sure which one. Uh, but I'm just going to warn you, I'm a passionate Eagles fan, but my kids are more so. All right? So be careful. Don't wear any Dallas things around them because they get easily triggered, okay? A courageous faith requires gospel-centered action. Right? It, it, it isn't, you know, Paul says it's standing. It, it, it's, it's working side by side. It takes action. A courageous faith requires gospel-centered action because we don't, live in a safe world. And so we have to have a courageous faith that takes action. Look at verse 28. He says, Not being frightened in any way by your opponents, for this is evidence of their destruction, but your deliverance, and this is from God. So he says, take action. Listen, sometimes God will give you courage when you take action the step he's asking you to take. We, we want courage first, right? We want to say, God, zap me with some courage, right, so that I can live faithfully. God, if you, because we know, like, how many of you ever wanted God to zap you? Not in a bad way, right? But, you know, because we just, yeah, I'm, I am like, God, you could fix this. You could just fix this. You could, you could zap this situation. You could zap that person, right? Are you with me? You shouldn't think like that. We, we, want, we know God could do that, but sometimes God does not what? He doesn't give us the courage to do what He's asking us to do until we take the step. Gospel-centered action is required for courageous faith. He says, don't be frightened by your opponents. This is evidence. Your deliverance is from God. Verse 29, he says, for it has been given to you on Christ's behalf. 
not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for Him, having the same struggle that you saw and I had and now hear about me. You know, there are some verses that I wish were not in the Bible. Are you with me? I am suffering adverse. Anybody else? Right? Am I alone? Somebody? Okay, yes, thank you. All right. The rest of you are more courageous than I, right? I don't like suffering. Are, are you with me? But sometimes God allows, permits, and even calls us to suffer for Him. And Paul and Jesus and the Bible make that very clear. He says, you've been given on Christ's behalf the privilege of believing in Him and knowing Him, but also to suffer for Him. And that's why we need a courageous faith, because sometimes God will call us to suffer for him. Now, we don't have to go out and seek suffering. Are you with me? Don't try to manufacture suffering. Right? God will lead you, He will guide you, and He will sustain you. But, but Paul, lived, you know, Paul lived this testimony. I mean, as we read about Paul's life and his journey, he suffered greatly for the cause of the gospel and for Jesus Christ. He was beaten. He was shipwrecked. He was thrown into prison. He was mistreated. He said sometimes we were out in the cold, sleepless nights. He suffered, and so did others, Polycarp, and down through church history, and even today, all around the world, believers in Christ. Today, while we're here, other followers of Jesus will give their lives for their testimony of, of, of their faith in Christ. And they'll do so courageously because they believe, they believe that the sufferings of this present life are not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed in us one day. God allows suffering sometimes, whether it's through persecution, sickness, pain, the death of someone that we love, emotional pain, relational pain. God allows suffering. We don't always understand it, and it doesn't always make sense, but I want you to know that it is not an absence of God's love for you. It is not an absence of His care for you. In fact, Jesus enters our suffering with us. He's compassionate. He cares, He knows, and He understands. And I want you to be able to trust Him and to be able to take action. Because here's the thing that Paul would say. If he could say something to us today, I think he'd say this. Just one thing. Live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because in the end, that is all that will matter. In the end, that's the only thing that will really matter. That I lived in a manner that was worthy. Listen, walking worthy isn't about keeping the rules it's not about never breaking a commandment or doing everything perfectly. It's about taking action, about standing firm, about following Jesus passionately and in a manner that reflects the reality that you understand the gospel, that you understand what Jesus did for you, who he is and what he's made you to be and who he's made you to be in Christ. You know, I shared a little bit about this Sunday night, but when I came here on this very campus 24 years ago, God convicted me that I was not living my life in a manner that was worthy of the gospel. I knew Jesus. I had become his follower. I, 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 I went to church on Sundays. I loved going to church on Sundays. I even went on Sunday nights. I listened to the sermons and I would nod my head and think, yeah, that's good and that's for me. And then I didn't do anything with it. Different reasons. Wanted to fit in. Didn't want to stand out. Didn't want people to think I was weird, even though that didn't work out. But I came here and I began to see other people who took their faith in Jesus seriously. Not perfectly, but seriously. And I thought, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. That's who I am. And I'm not actually living out who I am. And it's not been a perfect journey since then, by any stretch. I'm not a perfect follower of Jesus, just like you're not, nor anyone is. But God changed the trajectory of my life that summer. And what I've been praying for you is that God would do for you what He did for me. And that you would realize the call that you have to live a life worthy of the gospel. Not perfect, not never making a mistake, not never failing, but passionately pursuing Jesus and taking action, living for Him. And so I just want to challenge you, is there something in your life, maybe a sin, a habit, something that you're holding on to that's holding you back from walking worthy of the gospel? And maybe God's brought you here to, to let that go, to confess that. And here's the amazing thing. There is grace for every bit of our past. Right? Your failures are not final. 
The Bible says if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I want you to live lives worthy of the gospel of Christ. It won't be easy and it won't be safe. But it will be worth it because one day soon, sooner than you can imagine, you will see your Savior face to face. And in that moment, you will know that it was worth it. Let me pray for you. Father, I confess that, that in so many ways and on so many days, I have failed to walk worthy of my calling. But Father, I thank you that you have been gracious and you are patient and forgiving. But Father, I pray that in my life, in each student's life, in our counselors, our staff, our faculty, Father, I pray that you would awaken a desire and a passion to understand just how deeply we are loved by you, accepted by you, and Father, understanding the price you paid for us, that we would desire to live a life worthy of the gospel of Christ, equal to the weight of our calling, and that we would realize that we have a purpose, that you saved us on purpose, and that you want to use our lives for your glory. Father, help us to develop a courageous faith that we might do that. In Jesus' name.